אוקיי, אז אפשר לומר שסיימנו בינתיים עם, ה... עם דברי האגדה ואנחנו יכולים להתקרב לקניידלך, ואת הקניידלך יגיש לנו היום פרופסור דוד רוסקס. באמת כבוד ועונג לנו לארח, אמנם מרחוק, אבל כמו שפרופסור וייס אמר, זה נראה רחוק, אבל אנחנו מרגישים קרוב את פרופסור דוד רוסקס, או דוד רוסקס, שזכויותיו בחקר ספרות ותרבות יידיש וההיסטוריה היהודית של יהודי מזרח אירופה מוכרים והולכים לפניו כבר מזה שנים רבות, ספריו, מאמריו, הם אבני יסוד בכל מחקר שעוסק בתרבות יידיש וכאמור בהיסטוריה, היסטוריה תרבותית של יהודי מזרח אירופה. הוא נענה בשמחה וברצון להצעה שלנו והנה שוב קרה מקרה והוא לא יכול להיות כאן נוכח פיזית אבל גם על המסך זה מספיק כדי ללמוד ולהחכים מדבריו וכולנו מצפים לשמוע וללמוד ממנו על קולות, הקולות של המודרניזם ביידיש או כפי שנכתב בתוכנית Voices of Yiddish Modernism. פרופסור רוסקס בבקשה היי, נכבדי, 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 He's not my name. Chapter one, A Midsummer's Night in Queens. In the summer of 1971, when I was teaching at the Uriel Weinreich Yiddish summer program, young Kevin Fanny Glotstein invited me for dinner. But instead of getting on the train to Queens, my then wife and I headed towards Brooklyn by mistake, and we arrived an hour late. Gladstein took it all in stride and interrupted his conversation only long enough to introduce us to his other dinner guest, the journalist Shin Lamed Schneider. After dinner, Gladstein took me aside and for some reason started declaiming the opening lines of Moshe Leib Balkram's Anath. Oh hi, oh ho, ve'ruf tazon, there is the man Is this even Yiddish? He asked me rhetorically. From the bombastic way he declaimed these lines, it was obvious the answer was no. I can no longer remember what prompted Gladstein's outburst. Had I seen a copy of In New York on the bookcase and then expressed my admiration for the poet? I was young and foolish, that's for sure. because I didn't la- ask Gladstein to elaborate, nor did I take any notes, thinking I would never forget a single detail of our visit. I do remember my own reaction, though. I was shocked that Gladstein, our great national poet, would make light of Anath, the first apocalyptic poema in Yiddish, and the chilling finale to In New York, the book that made literary history. Should I have told my host that I once wrote a seminar paper for Professor Schmerick at the Hebrew University comparing the two variants of Anath? Should I have mentioned that Leib Rochman and I had sat up late into the night reading that poem together and so doing discovered that the Polish edition of In New York from which we were reading had censored Halpern's parody of the Sermon on the Mount? What was the source of Blachstein's animus? Was he debunking just this poem, just the opening lines of this poem, or perish the thought of poetry of Moshele and Halbern as a whole? Like most of his readers, I valued Gladstein primarily as a poet of the Holocaust. The first time I heard him speak was at the 
community-wide Holocaust commemoration at the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in Montreal in 1964. And six years later, I wrote Night Words, a midrash on the Holocaust, which turned his poem, Nicht the Mason, Leuvenbord, into the centerpiece of a counter-liturgy. More than a poet, Lachstein for me was a theologian whose agnostic poems to God had made my return to the life of Jewish observance possible. In 1967, the World Federation of Baron Belsen Associations issued a volume of Gladstein's Holocaust poetry that was designed to look like a prayer book. So maybe it occurred to me that Midsummer's Night in Queens, the source of his animus concerned the Holocaust which had so eclipsed all prior catastrophes that, to write as Halpern did, somehow violated the prevailing norm. Is this even Yiddish? Could have meant. Is this a legitimate Jewish response to catastrophe? There was a right way and a wrong way to evoke the nightmare of history, Gladstein seemed to be saying, and Halpern's Anath had been a false start. But why? because it opened with the horsemen of the apocalypse leading a band of Cossacks in his way. When Gladstein, at the age of 23, burst onto the literary scene with his poem, Nights and Nights, he captured the modern apocalypse through the fragmented consciousness of one Yankel de Radjitzko. Ruth Whitman, his translator, whom I knew from Boston, had even recorded Gladstein reading this poem, which is how I first heard it. So, was this the anxiety of influence, the Gladstein of 1919, defined as most important precursor? Or was it the Gladstein of 1971, defending his own turf, the new poetics of Jewish catastrophe, so relevant of Jewish covenantal language that stood against the apocalypse? Recalling that evening, a half century later, what I now hear are voices within voices because since then I have become a disciple of Bhakti. Anath opened with an ominous, threatening, primitive call. Whatever it portended, it was intent on perpetrating evil. Gladstein's performance turned it into what Bhakti called a double voiced utterance. Gladstein appropriated Halpern's oracular mode for his own purposes. He meant for me to hear both the version of the original utterance as the embodiment of the speaker's point of view, and Gladstein's evaluation of that utterance from a different point of view. And this is what I hear Gladstein saying. The poem's overt gesture to modernism was merely a pretense of novelty. Its opening lines, such an obvious giveaway of something boring, something so palpably foreign to the sound of Yiddish. What invalidated this poem, rendered it inauthentic and un-Yiddish in Gladstein's judgment, was precisely the speakerly voice within Albert's poem, supposedly the inner voice of a young Jewish immigrant in New York. Oh hi, oh ho, wer ruft da so? Wer ist der Mensch, was ist er auch von Bahn in halber Nacht? Horsemen of the Apocalypse didn't speak Yiddish. This mensch on horseback, I now believe Gladstein to have been saying, was not a visceral response to a primal catastrophe, but a souvenir of Halpern's years in Vienna, or a relic of Nietzsche or even Wagner. The opening lines of Anah gave the game away. It was someone ventriloquized, a novice trying on someone else's voice. The truth of Yiddish modernism, in other words, rested on its voices. And therefore, my takeaway from that Midsummer's Night in Queens is that the surest way to chart the genealogy of Yiddish modernism is through the polyphony of its dramatic voices. So this is what my lecture tonight is really about. I shall circle back to where I began, Yankov Gladstein, 
But in order to map the trajectory from A to Z and from Gimel to Gimel, I must flash back once again to 1971. The allure of Yiddish modernism today, the compelling reasons for holding this conference, were a long time in coming. In the beginning was the broken timeline of Yiddish modernism. Chapter 2, The Broken Timeline of Yiddish Modernism. Gladstein died suddenly later that year. He was 75, and a new volume of his poetry was about to appear. Ruth Whitman, Rabbi Emanuel Goldsmith, and I drove up for the funeral, which took place on November 21st. All the eulogists, each representing another branch of Yiddish land, recited the same poem, a Butanat belt, as if Blachstein had written nothing else, as if he had prophesied the Holocaust, as if mourning the Holocaust had been the sum and substance of his poetic career. If Blachstein had once gone whoring after strange gods, he had done public penance in this poem by calling on Yiddish secular culture to return to the fold, to go back to the ghetto. So far as the Yiddish establishment was concerned, the circle was closed. Once a yid from Lublin, always a yid from Lublin. On the drive back to Boston, I was in such a rage that I wrote my one and only Yiddish poem, which appeared in, on the editorial page of Yubertruf. In a kleisel dickens dom bet, I wrote. Hot men ein gebrest dem Welt poet. Then, pulling out the stops, I come on one of Gladstein's earliest poems, Tirteltoy, to deliver this furious indictment. Der Tirteltoy ver Eulen hat lovendig bewegt dein greis junten Kopf, wo sie allein haben verkäuft vor a top, wo ist gewette Träume. I was on the warpath. And the object of my wrath was the establishment, the very people who had raised and educated me. For by 1971, I was beginning to suspect that there was a conspiracy of silence surrounding the brief but spectacular chapter in Jewish literary history called Yiddish Modernism, aided and abetted by Yiddish critics, pedagogues, and party activists. Every few months, for example, a new volume of the Mustafa from the Yiddish Literature would arrive in my parents' home from Buenos Aires. Each volume handsomely printed in the modern Yiddish orthography and accompanied by a scholarly apparatus. Nowhere to be found, however, was there a volume dedicated to Halpern or Gladstein. The pantheon of American Yiddish poetry was built around Levin, Yudyut Schwarz, and the Jungian. There was hardly a woman poet or prose writer worthy of mention. The volume dedicated to Kulbach omitted his sins of Weimar. Der Mister was so hidden as to be invisible. No mention of Dvorah Vogel or Orit Svi Greenberg, the pride of Yiddish Galicia. Yiddish modernism remained a closely guarded secret. To be sure, the status of the modernist project was inherently precarious. The favored modernist venue in Yiddish, as in other languages, was the little magazine. The 20-year lifespan of Inzich, 1920 to 1940, with some interruptions, was the exception rather than the rule. Some little magazines in America, like Bodden, Logman, and Cannon, didn't last beyond two or three issues. And none had more than a few hundred readers, if that. The proliferation of little magazines, in turn, arose from the tendency of these isms towards schisms in Conor Kronfeld's memorable phrase. Perhaps to stay on the cutting edge, modernist movements had to self-destruct. And how could it be otherwise, given that they arose against the backdrop of a world war, civil wars, pogroms, mass migrations, hyperinflation and the Great Depression, the rise of Hitler and Stalin, 
assassinations, show trials, and purges. If in English letters, the expats living in London, Paris, or Zurich wore their exile as a badge of pride, in Yiddish letters, just to stay alive was to be a guest in your own home. Those Yiddish modernists whose lives bridged the great divide of the Shoah acted as if they had something to hide. Anna Margolin said it best. When writing to Lane Feinberg in 1946, she asked then when, that when he translated her signature poem, Ich bin Gewena Mola into Russian, he transposed the last line, a line which I could not lift my hand to write in the present era of our great catastrophe. Bad enough, the speaker in this poem was pagan, gay, and incestuous, but he even made light of the unruly effeminate Jews. After the Shoah, such a line was simply inadmissible. So when it came time to consolidate their urban, be it for a literary jubilee or for some other reason, the surviving Yiddish poets routinely sanitized, bolderized, or otherwise normalized their modernist writings. Look for Leibig's social realistic dramas and prose in the two-volume Jubilee edition of his Alder, published in 1940, and you will find only Der Goyle and other visionary dramas in verse. Look for Arteriosclerosis, published together in the Inzief anthology with Nice and Nice and Tirtutoy. And you won't find it in Blachstein's retrospective volume, Fun mein Ganzer Me, exquisitely published by Israel London in 1956 and illustrated by Ilya Shore. Here, Blachstein presented his poetic oeuvre in reverse chronological order, to all appearances leaving the least for last. Try to find Aaron Zaitlin's apocalyptic poem, Metatron, written in 1922, to refute Greenberg's Mephisto in the two-volume compendium Lieder von Gruben und Lieder von Leuten, published by the World Federation of Bergen Belsen Associations in 1970. And you will find a revised version buried somewhere in volume two. Through the cover art and composition, Saitlin surrounded his entire poetic oeuvre with a halo of martyrdom and sanctification. In short, the leading modernist poets either covered their tracks, Lachstein, Greenberg, Leib, Leilas, Markus, Radich, Weinstein, Seitlin, Stop Writing, Hey Benjamin, Celia Dropkin, Anna Margola, Avon Winsler, Yud Lamantella, were murdered for a fogel or died, as did Michel Lift in 1953, at the age of 60. By 1945, the timeline of Yiddish modernism was broken almost beyond repair. The golden chain of Yiddish modernist, modernism snapped so completely that it disappeared without leaving a trace. And this happened not only in such places as Kiev, Warsaw, Lodz, Berlin, and Paris, which fell into enemy hands, but also in such sovereign Jewish spaces as New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. Chapter 3, Yiddish Modernism Lost in Fact. How then did we uncover the missing tracks, restore the missing timeline? Under whose auspices did such a rescue operation happen? Who were the counter conspirators? Conspirators, and, uh, and why did it take so long? For over half a century, the leading purveyor of Yiddish modernisms was Benjamin Ruschowski Harshad. 
not only as a poet, scholar, teacher, and translator, but also, and perhaps most enduringly, as an anthologizer. The first of his major anthologies was, let's see, can you see this? Yes. Ashbigal Afashtek, 1964. The most ambitious publication, by far, of the Paris from that, which carried the additional imprimatur of the Golden Gate and Sitzgiver's name on the cover, thus ensuring the highest editorial, orthographic, and typographic standards. A Spiegel of Hashtag was designed to be a Sefer, not a Buch, because each chapter was dedicated to another poet or prose writer whose life was cut short by Stalin. Khrushchevsky was responsible for representing the poets Zevlet Axelrod, Itzik Pfeffer, Shmuel Halkin, David Hofstein, Izzy Kharin, Moshe Kulbach, Arlen Kushnirov, Leib Kvitko, and Peretz Markish. While Juan Shmerov was responsible for Berglason, Ernister, and Shmuel Persson. Unbeknownst to the reader, however, is that this monumental project was ideologically driven. A Spiegel of Ashtain was funded by Lishkata Keshe, a secret arm of the Israeli government, whose main interest was to rehabilitate the martyred Soviet Yiddish writers as Jews and to reclaim a lost tribe of the people of Israel. The aim of this anthology was not to call attention to Yiddish modernism per se. Soviet totalitarianism, after all, did not tolerate explicit modernism any more than it, than it did expressions of petty bourgeois nationalism. A Spiegel of Ashtain opened the first chapter in the reclamation of Yiddish modernism. Since the 12 martyred writers were presented in their birth order, the careers of the older writers, Berbison, Bernstein, and Hofstein, predated the Bolshevik Revolution, while Markish and Kvitko appeared as the first sons of the revolution. Khrushchevsky's artful selection of Peretz Markish demonstrated a unique feature of Russian modernism, how neoclassical forms and semantically compact imagery went hand in glove with the use of myth and wildly subjective point of view, how acquiescence made strange bedfellows with futurism, Ahmadova with Mayakovsky. Thus, when Markish wrote the Kupe, his apocalyptic sequel to Halpern's Anath, it opened astonishingly with a formal sonnet. Khrushchevsky presented the art of Markish's poetry as the art of Soviet Yiddish literature writ large. Youthful exuberance and modernist performance, followed by midlife crises and ending with a sober realignment with Jewish historical fate. In the wake of the Shoah and in the very midst of the Cold War, a Spiegel of Ashtain accomplished two important tasks. It turned Soviet Yiddish culture into a usable Jewish past and began the very slow process of mainstreaming the achievements of modernism. When Khrushchevsky moved to America, changed his name to Harshad and remarried, he opened the second chapter in the Reclamation of Yiddish Modernism. In 1986, he and his wife Barbara co-edited and translated the 813-page, lavishly illustrated and well-annotated American Yiddish poetry of bilingual anthology. Here, the modernist agenda was front and center. To begin with, only nine poets were included in the following non-chronological order. Aleph Leilis, Jakob Gladstein, Moshele Halpern, Yudlava Teller, Malka Chavitz Tuzman, Erich Weinstein, and pulling up the rear, Pele. This unusual lineup, in turn, was informed by Khrushchevsky's groundbreaking essay on free rhythms in modern Yiddish poetry, 
published when he was 26 years old. Despite Hershav's general aversion to the union, Leydig made, made the cut on the strength of his rhythmic versatility, and Halpern, another member of the group, received the credit for introducing free rhythms into modern Yiddish poetry, which led eventually to what Harshad called political talk verse, designed to express the sheer accidental stampede of life, or what Noverstern calls stream of consciousness and all that life. Halpern was to American Yiddish poetry as Markish was to Spiegel of Ashtain, the centerpiece, the most well-represented writer and the defining poetic voice. A unique feature of American Yiddish poetry, the anthology, was the graphic art, something that the conference is vitally concerned with. Wherever possible, the Harshavs tried to match the specific content of the poetry to a work of, by 20th century painters and sculptors. Artists who may have spoken English with a Yiddish accent, but went on to become modern American masters like Abraham Walkowitz, Max Weber, and Raphael Sawyer. Some of them indeed had collaborated in Yiddish literary publications like Schriften and Welt ein, Welt Bois. But the poets and painters met vastly different fates. The former consigned to oblivion, the latter elevated to fame. The purpose of the Harshad anthology, therefore, was to rectify the imbalance. Instead of reading this modernist pantheon as a forgotten chapter of Yiddish poetry in America, American Yiddish Poetry was a celebration of American poets who wrote in Yiddish. The goal of this anthology was nothing less than utopia, to naturalize Yiddish modernism into a multi-ethnic, inclusive, usable American past. Now, the only female poet admitted into the Harshav's modernist free rhythmic pantheon was Malka Chavitz Kuzma, the last of the introspectivists who settled in Los Angeles and spent her last years in Berkeley. Through her mentoring of Marsha Falk and Catherine Hellerstein, Chaitis Tuzman opened the third chapter in the reclamation of Yiddish modernism. For both Falk and Hal Hellerstein went on to translate modernist Yiddish poetry written by women. From Berkeley in the 1970s, the center of activity shifted to Toronto, in 1994, a collective of female Yiddishists published Found Treasures, stories by Yiddish women writers. And among their discoveries was the all but forgotten modernist, Luma Lempa, who was still alive at the time. Then in 2017, a native Torontonian, Shirley Kumova, published a bilingual edition of Anna Margolin's entire poetic oeuvre based on Robert Stern's definitive edition. From the work of Chaifetz Tuzman, Mark Golan, Lempel, Katya Molodowski, Celia Dropkin, and Rochel Korn in North America, the focus shifted to Poland with the discovery of the poet, critic, and theoretician Bora Fogel. Fogel is a major presence in Joanna Lisek's, Lisek's spectacularly beautiful Polish language anthology called Isha, the woman's voice in Yiddish poetry from the 16th century to 1939, followed by the translations of Vogel by Catherine Hellerstein, Anastasia Lubas, Anna Elena Torres, and most recently, Yael Levy. The recognition that Yiddish women writers were cultural change agents represented a fundamental shift in Jewish self-understanding. The moment Yiddish women poets and prose writers were widely acknowledged as vanguards of the new. Yiddish modernism became a usable feminist past. Harsha, remarkably, also opened the fourth Israeli chapter in the reclamation of Yiddish modernism. As a pivotal member of the Kras, he was responsible for introducing the first generation of Israeli poets to British and European modernism. And as a Hebrew translator, he championed the poetry of Sutzkever and the introspectivists 
Shirat Hayafin de New York, his eminently readable 2002 anthology, was designed to demonstrate that long before Israeli poetry was remade by the likes of Amichai, Abidan, Rabikovich, and Zaf, there were Yiddish poets in New York, the likes of Halpern, Blachstein, Leolis, and Brockett, who had brought the sound and sensibility of modernism home. It took the art of the anthology and textual archaeology over the course of half a century to suture the broken timeline of Yiddish modernism. Harshad's rule of thumb when excavating Yiddish modernism was always to favor the earlier versions of the poem to the final ones. When Berish Weinstein republished Rav Stieker, his inaugural collection, after the war, he expunged the overt eroticism and ethnic references that so clearly situated the poet in the 1930s. Harshav restored the original versions. So too when anthologizing Blackstein's earliest responses to the Shoah that were expunged from Fulmain Gansoni. The poets, after all, were co-conspirators, and I was wrong to place the blame squarely on the shoulders of Yiddish critics, pedagogues, and party activists. Yiddish modernism was yet another fatality of the multiple traumas of Stalin, Hitler, and the willful abandonment of Yiddish on the part of Ashkenazi Jews. That is why its reclamation has taken so long. But this reclamation has also come at a price a Spiegel of Ashtain was published by the Karas Rabbah and the Golden Kate, now both defunct. American Yiddish poetry was published by the University of California Press. Broken timelines are only as strong as their weakest link. And that link is the current state of the humanities in the university. Wie es Christel sich, as I Chapter 4, The Theory of Modernist Yiddish Voices. Oh hi, oh ho, there is the man there is the man who is a 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 man is that even by modernist standards, it wasn't a Yiddish voice. So herein lay a major challenge. How to expand the expressive possibilities of Yiddish beyond the traditional sites of vernacularity, beyond the marketplace at night, beyond the shtibel and vestmenta, beyond the Nalefkes and East Broadway, such was the liberating force of modernism that it gave free reign to mixing and matching the particular and the universal, the personal and the national. Harsha called this mixing and matching positive eclecticism, which in Yiddish would be positive fausteten minikat. The great divide, the great machoikis between symbolism and post-symbolism was over the principle of heterogeneity. Exhibit A is Poitsch, Ernestus debut in the Literarische Monatsstift, the first venue of Yiddish modernism in the Russian Empire. Republished 56 years later in Aspiegel of Ashtein, it excites the contemporary reader with its mix of Hasidic ethnography, healthy eroticism drawn directly from Shira Shirin, Kabbalistic symbolism, and, synest and the synesthetic play of the sounds of klezmer music. Shinansky hated it for all these reasons. His item, drawn directly from Russian symbolism, was to create the perfect artifact that never revealed the sources what I call the art of creative betrayal. Modernism, in marked contrast, reveled in the art of the incongruous, in the heterodox, 
Its juxtapositions were designed to startle the reader, to defamiliarize, to be jarring. Thus, the voices of moderns were deliberately inconsistent, incompatible, and oftentimes incoherent. Kind of Kronfeld described the Nath as a melange of voices and masks. Abram Naberstern showed how the principle of heterogeneity governed the form and substance of such diverse modernist works as Halbern Zarfi by Mbegian, Kulbach's Moshiach Ben Afrayim, and Leolis's Sumir Tzadir. Yiddish modernism shared this penchant for the fragmented, the fractured, and the discordant with modernism worldwide. Modernism unleashed a ferocity of debate, no holds barred, that tested the boundaries of blasphemy. It was pouring 24-7. Parents had set the stage at night in the old marketplace, a Valpurgis nut presided over by a half-crazed Bach. Then came Menschel playing first fiddle in Halbern's Anath. Then Greenberg gave Mephisto the last word. Then Markish flung the Ten Commandments into the heap of corpses below. Then Kulva gathered together the Lamed Bogniks, Jesus, Simcha Plachten, Mashiach Ben Afai, Gimbal the Philosopher, and let them loose. Then Zarfia of Seashore railed against everything. Michal Liv wrote Belbel Goth's Rabelaisian autobiography. And Bachstein deconstructed Yiddish culture voice by voice in Yiddish touch. If there was a Yiddish modernist canon, it was made up of parodic and blaspheming voices that were encyclopedic in scope. Who held these disparate, warring voices together was the bohemian, sexually active, and hyper-intellectual center of consciousness. Ezra Pound called him, called them persona, the stranger, the more exotic, the better. Here is how Blachstein described Fabius Lind, the poetic alter ego of his colleague and chief competitor, Alice Mayonis. The name Fabius Lind, with its surface sound of foreignness, symbolizes the full scope of foreign influences that the modern poet has absorbed in order to enrich the original inherited Jewish sources. The sound of Fabius Lind is intimately tied to new form and innovative content and represents no less an achievement than the Jewish sounding names Mandela, Shalom Aleichem, Yitzchak, Leibush, Avram, and Moshe Lein. The name, in other words, was the measure of the distance traveled from the old world to the new. Hence, Aaron Curtis's Figaro, Nun Beis Minkos, Unzer Piro, Anna Margolin's Marie, and Michal Lift's Velvel Goth. Glachstein's first overtly Jewish persona was Yossel Loksh, the rabbi of Chalam, at once parodic and politically engaged. Yiddish modernism was civilizational in scope metaphysical in reach, and psychological in depth. All this demanded a new language, new voices, and a new cast of characters. Fifth and last chapter, a polyphony of voices. Oh hi, oh ho, there is the soy, there is the man for sees a lot from bargain hall That's the thing about voices. They break out of the past to speak in the present. You can hear them on a midsummer's night in Queens as if they had just spoken for the first time. For me, hearing the horseman's cry at age 23, it seemed terrifyingly fresh, raw, menacing. It carried me back to a nighttime in New York, circa 1916. Every day this voice proclaimed was an apocalypse of the mind. But not for Glutchstein. For him, 
the ethically lofty manner and mystical suggestiveness of the horseman's cry still reminded him of everything he had rejected when at the age of 23 he published his own stripped down version of Halpern's Anath. Night's Nights captured the modern apocalypse through the tired, phlegmatic, almost deadpan voice of one Yanko Bevetiasvak. This is how the speaker self-identified in the second line with his voice of phenomenon, the name by which he would have been called up to the Torah had he speaking in the old country. But all that remained of this person was a clenching pintola, a kind of things, a small round dot, which, as Harshav explains, is a clever play on the idiom, the pintola yi, a person's Jewish core or essence. In other words, nothing remained of the old country Jew but a little dot madly rolling about in the metropolis with hooked on clumsy limbs. No such Yiddish voice had been heard before, yet its authenticity was unmistakable. It was the voice of the uprooted urban intellectual in the new world. It was an amalgam of Zisha Landa's persona a phlegmatic, slightly decadent poet who spoke his lines directly and the voice of J. Alfred Prufrock, the wannabe lover who had just made his debut in June 1915. And here is my rendition of how Gottstein read the poem to Ruth Whitman. And as it can be heard on Shepard Zucker's invaluable CD, The Golden Apocalypse. Die letzte Zeit ist kein Spur nicht mehr geblieben von Jan von der Lebensberg. Noch ein kleinchen Pinter, der auf Keilach ist, was keinen Sinn zu dort der Held in Bankassen, mit der Ruf gechappelte, ungelumperte Glieder. Der Euber war mit dem Himmel bläu, die ganze Erde da umgeregnet, in den Tocken werden. Und mit dem Fall Extras von Euben und zu plätschen, mein Wasser liegen kann. Und einer mit der langen Zunge hat mit der Stück Reut meiner Brille nach Ewig passiert und Reut, Reut, Reut. Ihr Herr, auch die Tät, wenn der Besser so ins in meinen Kopf platzen und mit Tempen kracht sie von Sinten da und überlassen nach Kupke schmutzig mit dem Arsch. Und ich, das Kalt mit der Pintere, will sie bleiben in Erde nach Ewigkeiten mit Reut und Reut und Reut und Reut und Reut. In 1919, the young Gladstein measured himself against Halpern by taking 21 lines of unequal length to do what Halpern needed 25 cantos to do, to render the apocalypse introspective. Armed with a psychological mandate to capture the kaleidoscopic nature of the mind and free to let go of meter and rhyme, Gladstein could also dispense with the pyrotechnics of a man and a man shall have, and cut directly to the chase. The red, as he explained to a seminar organized at the Evo on Janet Hara's behalf, so that she could meet the subject of her dissertation for the first time, did not signify the First World War, the pogroms in Ukraine, or the Red Scare in America, but rather the crises of modern life that were closing in on all sides. These were also the function of the screaming headlines falling from above. Extra, extra, read all about it. Now, assembling all these splinters of reality, the poet addressed his listeners directly in the last lines. You heard? Circled back to the pintale, to the red tongue blotting out the blue sky and translated it into an infinitesimally small dot hurtling through the universe in a red veil of ether. A science fiction-like vision, it was based on Bergson's theory of memory traces of the mind. But what rendered it credible, what grounded it within a lived experience, was the poetic voice. Like the Pintalem, 
this urbane, self-analytic male voice also faded out into the ether of eternity. It was a voice designed to register the chaos of the modern mind on any given day in 1919. Thus spake Yankel Rebecca. The evolving and competing voices of Yiddish modernism were the truest measure of its ambitions, achievements, and global reach. When the writings of Markish, Greenberg, and Saban arrived on American shores, the turf war between the Inzichisten and the Jungian shifted into an intercontinental rivalry with expressionism. Once the Yiddish modernists in America adopted the understated tonality of their Anglo-American counterparts, the voices of the Chalaskwe sounded bombastic, tedious, and ridiculously theatrical, what with their egocentric pathos, wild, dualistic imagery, punctuated by rhetorical questions, exclamations, and mantra-like repetitions. <coughs> the Polish Yiddish ears, in sich, sounded archaic, solipsistic, and utterly prosaic. It suffered from a rationalist elitism, was weighed down by scientific terminology, ether, arterial arteriosclerosis, was reduced to a microscopic scale to mere dots and used ordinary speech rhythms. Going public, the poets took their battles to the pages of the Warsaw-based Mitterrache of Letter and to every little magazine published in New York, even while they refused to let go of the old and still festering rivalries from before. Whether understated or overstated, Yiddish modernism had one thing in common, a very strong literary tradition to rebel against. To start anew, Yiddish modernists needed to liberate themselves from the oracular, prophetic, angelic, demonic, and exegetical voices of the past, release them from their sacred contexts, and throw them into the ring of the embattled mind of the modern Buddhist Jew. One day, as the solitary, chain-smoking, bohemian poet stood, Klein und Volchtig, ja Feugel, hinter der Gedanken Weltmichitzer, small and attentive like a bird behind a thought world partition, he overheard God's cold mamad daka, still small voice, lamenting that for Mephisto, that Mephisto had completely usurped and perverted the voice of God. Then he heard Mephisto's wild laughter, followed by a parody of God's voice from out of the whirlwind, delivered in 79 emphatic, highly rhetorical lines. So great were his powers, Mephisto boasted, that he could even seduce young nuns on moonlit nights. Unir zing in zeyer cholen, dada istish, shir hashirin. And in their dreams, I sing to them, dataistically, the Song of Songs. Job and the Song of Songs were the perfect foil for Yiddish modernists because they represented the most ancient strata of the Jewish dialogical imagination. Just open any Blood Gemara, and there was dialogical material galore for the modernist writer to play off. In Halper and Zarfi at the seashore, a parodic free-for-all lasting from sunset to sunrise. One whole section was devoted to Zarfi teaching Torah, full of mock quotations in pseudo-Aramaic and interpolated legends that did or did not yield their allegorical meaning. Shabrulim ledarfi peruma, light hidden in darkness, the last prayer of the saint. Or maybe, who knows, maybe it means something altogether different. And the tongue will roast in hell for not interpreting it right. Shabuli le darchi perguma, bahalten in lichtigkeit in der finster, die letzte Twille von Azadim. 
Und er hat schon gesagt, er hat schon gesagt, dass Borgo hat das Adam schon immer. Und die Zunge wird sich Brot nehmen gehen, weil sie hat nicht ausgeteilt, wie man darf. What is Zarkvi's complaint? That all sacred language is turned into mumbo jumbo in a secular age? That making sense of the last, of the last prayer is as absurd as belief in its sadiq? That the habit of the Jewish exegetical mind is nothing but a demonic game? Or is the ultimate joke to believe in a halt in the lichtigkeit in der finster, light hidden in darkness? and all the claptraps that poets lose sleep over. That's the thing about polyphony. It keeps you guessing. There's no way of pinning the poet down. No way of knowing which voice comes closest to speaking for the author. I don't know, maybe if Bakhtin could read Yiddish, he could have helped us out here. But If we learn anything from this schnell Neuf über Yiddish Modernism, our quick tour of Yiddish Modernism in the wake of Yankov Flashdain, it is to always trust the voices. And there's no doubt about it, Halvern's voice was the indigenous voice of Yiddish parody. The more vernacular, the more particular. Following as we have a loose chronological order and going from east to west, From, Gladstein, from Greenberg to Gladstein and beyond, it is even possible to say that by means of parody and stylization, Yiddish modernists were able to connect with the deepest sources of their language and culture. In their hands, every Yiddish idiom was destabilized and deconstructed. The spintalayi became a tiny dog rolling through the ether of eternity. And every taich could be oisketeicht, the opposite way. To earn their spurs, for epate, la bourgeoisie, to provoke the party faithful, the Yiddish modernists felt obligated to display their radical cosmopolitanism, their heterodoxy, their obscenity, but to purify their dialect, to reconnect with their Jewish roots, to make Yiddish the sum and substance of their world, they each had to find their most polyphonic voices. Yiddish touch, the title of Blachstein's fourth book of poems, declare the sovereign polyphony of Yiddish. The title's plural form demonstrated the eccentric and endless possibilities open to a highly skilled language artist. Taich, in the sense of meaning, exegesis, or gloss, signaled to his audience that for a text to yield its manifold Taichen, it would need to be parsed word by word. Out of the young pluralized Yiddish, Gladstein wished to generate a new poetic language. So Gladstein reassembled his poems, written from November 1928 to April 1935, eight fraught and fatal years, into a carefully structured volume, something he learned to do from Michelet Papa. Then examine the games that language plays from cradle to grave, especially at night, the setting for most of the book, when to ward off the fear of the dark, people were particularly susceptible to cliches, Lyric poets spread their glowing sentimentality and worn out rhymes in hymns to the night. Oi the night, oh the night, oho the night, aha the night. Dark haired, disheveled poets of social protests were especially active. And Chedev Diki Yiddish Taj, charming folksy phrases, evoked the cheapest emotions in the reader. In a world where words and ideas had lost their meaning, This proud member of the word proletariat armed himself in silence and personal wisdom, a panzer mit Schweigen und Blutsein, in order to liberate the word from the overload of sense. Wickelstock, Wald, von Mein. And the proof that this was possible was the book's grand finale, which will be our grand finale too.
the poem zum Kochmeister, to the brain master, which Norberstern has aptly described as an ecstatic ode to the modernist muse, a latter-day song to the leader in the temple of verse, ecstatic and fiercely polemical. The poem was an attack on all fronts, on the sentimental poets from Shimon Zwug to Baron Lachen, on the professional critics from Yoel Antin to Shmuel Nigar, on the communists, the self-haters, the Puritans, the false prophets and preachers. Leonis, who was present when the poet complained this poem before an audience, not made up of 18 carrot modernists and lovers of ambiguous poetry, Leonis attested that it made a very strong impression. The audience was most enthusiastic and what amazed me more than anything was that they were most taken by the serious, absolutely unplayful aspects of this magnificent accomplishment. I was almost ready to revise my negative opinion of the Yiddish poetry year. 86 years later, this poem can still work its magic. Saith the poet, Hauptmeister, you call me, Achsen Karatike Werther. Dance master, I love 18 character words. Standhaftigkeit, Konsequentigkeit und Sil-Exzentrischkeit, Steadfastness, Consistency, and Syllabo-Exzentricity. Sayeth the Muse. Ach so, der Bon Mot, Hoppechach spitz zu. Ach so, I have the Bon Mot, the tip of my tongue. Aber es freut uns sich der Meilenheims, wie wenn mache wett, but the West is turning red, I bet you, as never before. Es freut uns sich der Zunter, bunt und bunter. The Tinder is getting redder, bolder, and ever gaudier. Nicht geguckt, sei der Lofsky der Schiffboy, wo sehr sieht, sagt Kalter Bunter. Despite the fact, sei der Lofsky der Kaiju, that it's a cold winter wonder. For a vital and vibrant Yiddish to achieve sovereignty, for syllabo eccentricity to win the day, the enemy had to be laughed off the stage. Public enemy number one was the communist surge, turning the horizon blood red. And the intellectuals like Chaim Zhidlovsky, the chief ideologue of Yiddishism, your kindly Zayden, who was nothing but a boy parading as a Jew. All would turn to winter, to ice, should these ideal laws be allowed to prevail. Good morning, my heart, Dokkel, Mitten, Monokkel. Also, it's in them, a silly mirt, atrophiert und falsch tenirt. A viele der Ego zent is falsch fun, fun mund. Die eat bun, verlatet. Fazatet, Kemamet, Kentatet, Der Funbanet, Fabianet, Plata Zoya, Books, and Veggie Dukes. Good morning, my lord, Yogel, with your monocle. My, how acillaned and atrophied you've become and stonified. The egocentric has all but perished from your parlance. Your id and Jew wound patched and appeased. No mothered, no fathered, the wherefore, the wherefrom withered, just a growth of vegetoth. Eccentricity, egocentricity, the eccentricity of true creation flowed from the self with an acknowledged center a Nothmeister, a master imitator, a would-be intellectual, an ultra-assimilated cosmopolitan Jew who denied his circumcision, his wounded penis, his mother tongue, his parentage, his past. What was he if not a growth of vegetoth? For him, this extravagant, 
outrageously funny yet deadly serious display of linguistic virtuosity. This celebration of the people's greatest creation, its spoken language, Yiddish, was indecipherable, devoid of all meaning. That Gladstein turned Zum Kopmeister into a performance piece, much as Peretz Markish had once done when he declaimed Die Kuppe at a memorial gathering for the Ukrainian pogroms, speaks volumes for the ambitions and achievements of Yiddish modernism. In this polyphonic extravaganza, of which I have read only two brief segments, Gladstein created a new dialect that had to be parsed word by word, exactly the way Jewish children had been trained to parse the Hebrew Bible. A language that was no mere receptacle of the past, the sum and substance of what came before, but the harbinger of a sovereign Yiddish speech that was yet to come. It was a language that by making maximal demands created its own audience that thumbed its nose in prudery and censorship, a vocal public presence that refused to be marginalized, narrowly politicized or aestheticized. When Yiddish was young and defiant, modernism was the ultimate voice of that youthfulness and defiance. Looking back, it is also fair to say that the commitment to modernist principles, stubborn and increasingly at odds with the Jewish street, is what kept Yiddish young. Certainly, this was true for Yankov Gladstein, who continued to rail against the hackneyed un Yiddish voices as late as the summer of 1971. A grossen dank, a herzlichen dank von Balerewiken Lekzie, was mir oben gehört. Thank you very much for the instructive uh, overview of the voices of Yiddish modernism. We wish you good health and uh, a lot of uh, coming. Asach Sheferishkeit, besser gesagt, Azoi. Asach Sheferishkeit, for Asach Yorm. Wir sollen alle an Neuoben und Lernen von Eier Arbeit. A grossen Dank. Well, uh, as, as I said, the, the dean of the faculty, he, he, he was here, but he couldn't uh, stay. So uh, he asked me to uh, give his, uh, his uh, greetings, to, to read for you his, his uh, greetings. He apologized, he has other obligations in this time of the year. It's a very hectic uh, time. So uh, I'll read what he uh, prepared. My dear colleagues and guests, I'm honored to bring the greetings of the Faculty of Jewish Studies to the participants of the Conference on Avant-Garde in Yiddish Culture, organized by the Rena Costa Center for Yiddish Culture in the Department of Literature of the Jewish People. Uh, yeah. The program, uh, as well as the, uh, the Department of Hebrew Literature and Center of Yiddish Culture at Ben Gurion uh, University, and the program of Yiddish language, literature, and culture at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. The main focus of this conference is, the, is a series of discussions of, of how Yiddish literature responded to the uh, severe uh, crisis caused by World War I. The old world, the old world was destroyed and literature was in, uh, in responding to the, dis the, to the disorder in people's lives. Poets in Warsaw, including Uri Zvi Greenberg and Peretz Markish, believed that the poetry could spark a revolution. The First World War uh, and its aftermath 
created chaos not only in the material world of Eastern European Jewry, but also left a deep impression on its spiritual, spiritual world and on the Yiddish culture. Out of the ruins of that war arose the avant-garde genre of Yiddish. This avant-garde activ activity was characterized by sporadic gathering of authors and artists in different cities in, 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 in Europe and East Europe, by the publication of various literary and artistic journals, and by a significant contribution to modern Yiddish theater. All these aspects are, are and will be discussed in this conference. We often get to the impression that literature in the Jewish languages remained in the traditional formats and did not undergo any changes. Some scholars believe that literature in the Jewish languages sought to preserve the order of the old world. This conference is here to show the, the opposite. I'm not a Yiddish literature expert. I can only tell you that Ladino literature, and uh, I should, I should uh, mention here that uh, Professor Shmuel Raphael is also the head of the Institute of, uh, uh, of the uh, Research of, of Ladino at bar -Ilan University. So, I can only tell you that Ladino literature, literature also underwent major changes in the post-World War I period. The entire order of the old world was destroyed. Poetry became harsh and daring. Poets harnessed the poetry to express the new order and new upheavals. The sad thing is that neither the Yiddish nor the Ladino poets ever imagined that only a few years would pass until a great storm would arrive and seek to destroy the Jewish world completely. The avant-garde revolutionists had almost no strength left. I would like to thank the organizers of this conference. Thanks, he thanks me. <laughs> This conference was uh, originally scheduled quite some time ago, but COVID-19 uh, COVID disrupted uh, uh, everyone's plans. I welcome the guests who, who, have, who, who have come here, including Professor David Roskes of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, a well-known and leading scholar of, of uh, Jewish and Yiddish studies. I wish you success and regret that I'm unable to attend the conference. So uh, thanks to uh, Professor Shmuel Raphael.